stay put. Good. So uh, yesterday I announced something about green functions. Okay, let me just catch it and then we, we discuss about it more in the, in the exercise session, if you want. So we got to this uh, equation of motion, minus 16 pi g t mu nu, and then we massaged it, no? we massaged it a little bit and we got to this solution. Um, minus uh, 4 g lambda i j k l integral over 1 over the distance, t uh, k l t retarded, the integral, okay, let me just, instead of writing the d3x prime, I mean, the integral is just, I just write uh, the measure of integration like a index here. And then we got t dot, t retarded, uh, x prime, n dot x prime, okay? So yesterday we stopped here in this Taylor expansion, no? Yes. And uh, we, we know that the small parameter that uh, allow us to go to one order to the following order is V, the internal velocity of the source. Okay, one note, so here uh, I already massaged uh, the green function because the green function had one x minus x prime in the denominator, and I just forget x prime. And then there was the retarded time, but the retarded time depends on the position of the source. But then I Taylor expand the, you see, the space, the real space I integrate over, but the space mm, dependence inside the time entry of the, uh, coordinate dependence, I tailor expand because this is V. And because you have to remember, then it cannot be overstressed. It has been said many times. But you know, the, the size of this object is of the order of the Schwarzschild radius, or if it's a neutron star, it's slightly larger. But a neutron star is the size of 10 kilometers, which is roughly the size of the Schwarzschild radius of a six solar mass black hole. So it doesn't change so much. And then we have the radius, and we know that the, uh, between GM. And, and the radius, there is a, a v-square. Hmm? So this radius is larger by v-square. And then we have lambda, the wavelength of the radiation, which by definition has to be equal to the frequency, I mean, to the period, uh, the inverse of the frequency. And t uh, must be equal to r over v. So if you want to put... Uh, uh, the scale okay so v is our uh, small parameter that allows you to move from one scale to the other now this has been said many times but let me stress it once more because this is something that you can never forget when you look at uh, gravitational wave physics so this is just a summary of what we did so we implicitly oh no we implicitly we explicitly used the, the uh, retarded green function. So the retarded green function, uh, if you go to Fourier space, it looks like this. Okay, so you, you see some similarity with the Feynman green function, but it's not quite the same. Okay, because the Feynman green function has slightly different poles. So if I look at it uh, fr as poles as omegas, these I, I can expand it as. 1 over omega plus e epsilon minus modulus of k minus omega plus e epsilon plus modulus of k. This is just a mathematical identity. I think I did it correctly. Yeah, because if I put to a common denominator, this gives me d squared minus d squared, and then uh, omega plus e epsilon minus 1 and 2k, 2k, yes. And you see clearly that the two uh, poles are on the same side. Okay, then if you have plus i epsilon minus i epsilon depends on your, con your convention of the Fourier transform, of the anti-Fourier transform. For me, f of t is equal to f tilde of omega e to the minus omega t integrating in omega. Yes, I use this convention for the Fourier transform. I mean, you can use the other one and then you flip the sign of this i epsilon. And uh, when you do this, the two poles happens to be here. So for the Feynman, you know they are one below and one above. For the advanced green function, you just reverse time. Reversing time is just reversing omega, and so is the other sign for the advanced. So 
One thing that I will ask you to demonstrate, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. I could even do, do it on the board, but let's spare time because we have many things to, uh, to tell you today. Basically, what you can do is do this um, uh, um, uh, Fourier transform to get to, uh, to get um, a form which is uh, explicitly in time, and so you get that the retarded green function once I integrate it over omega. So at least if I get so it should be e to the minus i omega t e to the i k x that function, and then you see if you um, consider that t um, is negative, then you have to close above, and then any, everything is zero, hmm? because you're not picking any uh, pole. Then the result you understand that it must be uh, proportional to a theta of time. So it's only when you close down that you pick the poles, and you pick both of the poles. And so the results come out this one. Where, I mean, it's trivial, no? You just make the integration, and you pick this pole plus this pole, and then there is a 2 pi i. Uh, a 2 pi, the integral, for me, the integral in omega in k is always d omega divided by 2 pi, d 3k divided by 2 pi cubed. So the 2 pi of the residues uh, theorem uh, simplifies with the 2 pi in the measure. You're left with the i. And then delta plus, delta minus are just the standard uh, um, Whiteman functions. d3k e to the minus kt e to the chi x. OK? So, I mean, e, you can also write um, Feynman green function in terms of the uh, Whiteman functions. Let me check if I did it, if I remember them correctly. If I remember them correctly. Let's see. Mm. Yes, the retarded is um, minus, actually, this one. Yes, because you have to, you, uh, when you close down, you go clockwise, so you get a minus. So it's minus i theta of t. Yeah, and then it's delta plus minus delta minus, no? Because when you pick one pole and then you pick the other pole, you have a relative minus sign. And uh, you see the 1 over the 2k is what uh, remains of the residue of the pole, and then you're left uh, with the uh, remaining integral e to the i k x. OK, this is the retarded green function. The uh, advanced green function is trivial. You just put a minus here. So the poles displace to the upper side. And so when you close, you get a, an extra minus sign, because now you're, cl you're closing counterclockwise, so there is no minus sign. The funny thing is that the Feynman green function in this representation is a combination of theta of t plus theta of minus t, which is exactly um, the Feynman green function is theta delta plus plus theta delta minus, modulo an i in front. I think it's minus i plus i. Uh, the five, no, it's a minus i in front of everybody. OK, so these are simple exercises. You just do the first integration over uh, omega of this shape. Of course, for the Feynman and Green function, the i epsilon goes here outside, because you have a different prescription than the two poles goes one here and here. So you have non-zero result, both if you close downstairs for um, t larger than zero, and if you close upstairs for t smaller than zero. So now the funny thing is that the G Feynman, you can verify, I mean, you can verify in any representation, but in this representation with the, in terms of Whiteman function, it's easier. You, you can verify that this is, actually you will verify because it's one of the exercises. You have this uh, equation for the real part. 
Well, what does it mean real part? This, in this expression, these are Fourier transforms, so the Fourier transform of a real function is, is never real. But look at this. This is really the Fourier transform of a um, uh, real function. How do you see that? Because if you send minus, sorry, there was a square here. I, if you send uh, um, omega in minus omega, you, you, it's like doing the complex conjugate. No? This, is the this is the prototypical uh, property of the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of real function is the property that this complex conjugate is equal to itself uh, evaluated uh, minus the argument. You see? You put a minus here, there is a square, it's like changing the sign of the i. So the retarded green function is really the Fourier transform of a real function. And indeed, uh, that's what we use here. It was a real function. The advanced green function is the same because the Fourier transform is just the complex conjugate of this. So the, the advanced green function is also the, um, the Fourier transform of a real function. But and uh, if it was like this, then the Feynman would be also. No? The Feynman um, would be also, but the Feynman is not because we know that the Feynman as this representation in Fourier space, minus k square, I think with my convention for the Fourier transform is plus i epsilon. Uh, yes, it's plus i epsilon with my convention. And so look at this, the Feynman-Green function is not the Fourier transform of a real function, okay? Because if you send omega in minus omega, it stays the same. It doesn't go to complex conjugate. So the Feynman, I mean, if you look in Fourier space, I mean, everything is complex, of course. But you have to think of the Fourier uh, transform of, uh, of a function in that space. So the Feynman-Green function in that space is complex. So that's what people say, the complex part of the Feynman-Green of the Feynman. It's really the intrinsically complex part. So in the intrinsically complex part is not accounted for this because this is the Fourier transform of a real, this is the Fourier transform of a real, this is not the Fourier transform of a real. So there must be a missing piece. And so what happens is the missing piece is exactly this. I mean, all of these are just the uh, trivial exercise that follows from using the um, contour integration. And just displacing the, the poles in the right, in the right direction. So you see, as far as the real part, the Feynman-Green function is the same as the average of advanced and retarded. It's like that if you have one particle, uh, I mean, the, the field depending casually on the source and the field depending casually on the source. But then there is this crucial piece, uh, which is intrinsically imaginary, which is the one that matters when you use the optical theorem, for instance. No? You go and you go on the poles, on the pole you take the imaginary part, and the imaginary part gives you what, uh, uh, what accounts for the decay in your uh, forward scattering process. And this piece is not including in advanced and retarded in fashion, because advanced and retarded are inherently real, whereas Feynman is intrinsically complex. In this sense, in the sense that it's a Fourier transform of a complex function, because in Fourier space everything is complex, okay? So this you can derive in detail in your exercises. And here it's important that for the emission, we have to use retarded because that's astrophysically motivated. My field at megaparsec away from the source depends on the source at retarded time. I mean, there's no way out of this. Whereas in particle physics, people use rather this other prescription. And you might have wondered, I mean, this other prescription, is, it has a piece which is a causal, no? Because it has this advanced piece. So how come that makes sense in particle physics to use uh, this other prescription? Have you ever been wondered? So this is one of the things that should be taught in quantum field theory course, beside the fact that one loop diagram contains a classical piece. They're not fully classical. They contain both a classical and quantum piece. So the one loop diagram and quantum is not really a lie. I mean, it's a lie. I mean, it's misleading because you might think, oh, they are fully, they are only quantum. No, they are both quantum and classical. Here, there is a <coughs> uh, one thing you should be wondering when you use uh, Feynman-Green function. And I, am I going to, uh, to consider a causal processes? Well, the fact is that if you take this representation of the uh, Feynman-Green function, and instead of integrating on omega first, you integrate on k first, then, and this is again an exercise we can go into in, in detail through it, we can go through it in detail later today. At the end, so you already, so let's say that this is GF of TX, which is the anti Fourier transform of that one. So at the end, you are left with this 
e to the minus i omega t because I did only the k integral. What happens is that after you do the k integral, here you get something like this. And let's assume spherical symmetry for simplicity. So the Feynman-Green function in direct space, if you take that and you first integrate in k instead of omega, so to obtain this formula, of course, I first integrate in omega and I put in the value of omega at the pole. I take the residual uh, that fix the values of omega in terms of modulus of k at the pole. This k is, of course, the modulus. Here, if you do this, you obtain this funny piece. So this is clearly neither a causal nor causal, as it should be consistently with that relation. So what does it mean? It means that for omega larger than zero, waves, uh, particles, if you like, are outgoing, right? Because for omega larger than zero, I get e to the minus omega t minus r. So when t grows, r grows, particles are outgoing. For omega smaller than zero, modulus of omega is minus omega, so you get e to the minus omega t plus r, particles are ingoing. That's exactly what you want to do when you want to mimic the setup of uh, particle physics experiments, okay? So in a particle physics experiment, you have known states that come in that are destroyed by particle destruction operator, and then you have also known states that go out in the sense that Outside, I mean, what, what you measure outside is given by the detector. So the detector will measure photons, gluons, quarks, whatever. Will not measure, for instance, dark matter, unfortunately. <laughs> will not measure, in most cases, neutrinos, okay? So you fix that there are some particles which are ingoing, and then you destroy them, and then you create some particles which are outgoing. So it's correct. That's the, the correct green function that you, 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 that you should use for to describe particle physics experiment. But it's not our green function, okay? Our green function is, is G-retarded, and this is the relationship. By the way, since this is a green function, and this is a green function, and this is a green function, also this is a green function, is the difference. So this is a green function is purely imaginary, and this is the one that takes into account of the leakage in quantum language of the probability. When you have a scattering, and then you, you send stuff out of your system, this is the part of the green function that gives this leakage of probability that you can translate to leakage of energy, leakage of particles. That's, uh, is that's, that's what makes the optical theorem work, for instance. Okay, so this is what I want. I know I've been a bit sketchy, but if I do all the derivation, then I soak up my hour, and then I don't speak about other even more interesting, I mean, this is already very interesting, but I can speak about even more interesting stuff. So, I mean, now you should be very excited. What can be more interesting than that? I will tell you. Any question about this? Okay, so what I want to do now. Ah, yes, the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic energy momentum tensor of gravitational waves. That's ultra important. So I probably, yeah, I can keep this. I can only cancel the green function. And by the way, then I, I will give you my, my view over the issue about um, uh, which diagrams are quantum and which diagrams are, uh, are classical. I'm, I might not get there by the end of today, but for sure tomorrow, if it's not today, I will give you my take on, on that issue. Because actually, that's an issue I've been pondering a lot when I started doing this kind of computation that was over 10 years ago. And then I said, oh, but I've been teaching in, uh, well, in Italy, we do quantum field theory very early, uh, not even in class school. Uh, I've been teaching to compute quantum scattering amplitude, and all of a sudden, I get loops which are classical. That bothered me a lot. And then I will give you the answer I've been pondering over my PhD years, or no, my postdoc years. OK, let's go to the energy momentum tensor now. So we, by the way, the notes are not updated with the latest bunch of exercises I will do right after the le this lecture. Okay, so for, uh, for the energy momentum tensor of gravitational wave, we have a very simple recipe. We, we rewrite the Einstein equation in this, in this way. J this is just trace reversed Einstein equation. They are fully equivalent to the standard one. So the Einstein tensor is Ricci tensor minus one half Ricci scalar. And then I basically uh, take that on the other side. And since from the trace of the Einstein tensor, I get. Uh, Tensor, uh, trace of Einstein is equal proportional to the trace of uh, energy momentum, then I get this, basically. 
And then I do the following. I want to separate what is gravitational wave from this background. Okay, in background, uh, if the background is Minkowski, this is very trivial, no? In, in Minkowski, the background, this gives me zero for that. So all what come out into Ricci from, uh, which is non-zero, all come out to the curvature must be ascribable to gravitational wave. But this construction is more general. Suppose I have a background, whatever it is, it doesn't need to be, mm, to be Minkowski, but it has to be one peculiarity. Otherwise, I don't even know how to define gravitational wave. Its time variation must be well separated from the time variation of gravitational waves. Once again, separation of scale. If you don't separate scale, it's a mess. Basically, if you have a system where scale is mixed, then it's a mess. So basically, this is the idea. I have a background which has a uh, time scale. For instance, Earth uh, Sun system, the time scale is over a year. Actually, we are in a pretty circular orbit, so our, uh, our gravitational potential due to the Sun doesn't even vary with the scale of the year. But I mean, I have some background gravitational field, and then I have some gravitational waves. So I do expansion to zero order, one order one, order two in my perturbation with the caveat that I can only make this uh, separation between background and gravitational wave only if the gravitational wave have a distinct in-time dependence than the background. For instance, uh, I can do gravitational wave in Freeman and Robertson Walker, no problem, provided that the scale of expansion of the universe is well separated from the gravitational waves. When the frequency of the gravitational wave is the, of the supposed gravitational wave is of the same order of the expansion rate of the universe, then forget talking about gravitational wave. You cannot talk about gravitational wave. It's all messed up together. And then I average over a distance, which is kind of twice, I mean once or twice, a bit longer, but not too much longer than the, than the wavelength. So this object, which is zero order in gravitational wave, stays the same. This object, which is first order in gravitational wave, disappear, just because I'm averaging over one wavelength, and this has to go to zero. This object doesn't disappear because this is the square of the gravitational wave. Suppose this gravitational wave is a cosinus. The square of the cosinus is a cosinus square. The average of cosinus square is not zero. It's one half. Okay. And then I move it to the other side. Okay, mathematically what I'm doing is trivial. Physically, it's actually very important. And then I'm saying, look, this is my effective energy momentum tensor of gravitational wave. Actually, not this. This, I mean, I have to rearrange in, in, in this shape, energy momentum tensor mi minus trace reversed, and I get mm, uh, my gravitational wave tensor. And then if I want to go to the TT gauge, it has a very simple it has a very simple expression. So in general, if you want to expand the Ricci or the trace reverse Ricci that I need to put here, a second order in gravitational way, I get six, seven terms. But then I can use the TT gauge, basically the fact that, that I'm projecting over some specific, very specific polarization, and then I get this. Uh, this is equal to uh, d mu h alpha beta d mu h alpha beta. Okay, I have to remember that I'm averaging. Uh, yes, and then there is a 1 over 32 pi g. Basically, because I have to, if I want to interpret it as an energy momentum tensor, it has to enter with an a pi g in the equation, so I put an a pi g, and then there was one fourth from the expansion. And then, of course, the rich expanded to second order contains much more term, but this is the only one that survives the TT gauge, because I'm not interested in the, uh, the polarization which are not, um, which are not uh, relative. So look at this, how simple, the, re the result is so simple that I don't even bother to, you know, to do the math more, because it's very simple to remember. Basically, each polarization counts as if it was a scalar field. No? Suppose we are dealing with the scalar field. What would be the, uh, sorry, this what I wrote is uh, T, it's not R. I was supposed to write it there, sorry. 1 over 32 pi g t mu h alpha beta d mu h alpha beta. This is, again, I am forgetting a lot of terms that are zero in the TT gauge, which means that they don't uh, convey 
information about radiative polarization. They convey information about uh, longitudinal polarization. So let's, ah, yes, I wrote it here already, GW. So suppose I was looking at um, <coughs> the um, energy momentum tensor of a scalar field. It would have been d phi square, okay? And so it's like if each polarization of the gravitational wave is contributing like a scalar field. But we know we, we would be badly overcounting if you consider all the time polarization. We know there are only two polarizations. Actually, we know we have only xx, xy, yx, and yy that contributes to this. So this we can actually write it as 1 over 16. If we write, for instance, t00, 16 pi g, h dot square plus h cross square. Again, average over a wavelength or something, a wavelength, two wavelengths. Okay, and then I get to this formula, which I think is correct, yes. You see, there is a factor of two because hxx and hyy, they are both h plus, so they give a factor of two. So now the analogy with a couple of scalar fields holds even more. No? At the level of uh, the energy they carry out is just uh, the kinetic energy of one polarization plus the kinetic energy of the other polarization. Okay, now uh, if you want to compute then the flux, yes. So this is not quite the right hand side of this equation because this is Armin nu. So Armin nu, so it should appear in this form. Armin nu it cannot be interpreted as T mu nu, but this has to be interpreted as T mu nu gravitational wave minus one half. Uh, eta mu nu t gravitational wave. It, this is equal to r mu nu 2. So how do I solve this? So first I take the trace. This is t minus 2t. Then I get the minus t is equal to r2. And then I substitute it. So I bring this to the other side. And then I get the t mu nu is equal to r mu nu. This is always gravitational wave, no? This is r mu nu 2 plus 1 half eta mu nu t. But I just derived that minus t is the trace, so I just write it here, minus r2. And this is the Ricci that contains only the contribution of the quadrat of the pieces that are quadratic in gravitational waves. Okay, so this expression, so uh, you, you can do second order expansion of the Ricci, it's not, I mean, even by hand, it's not too difficult. You get to a long expression with a 10-ish ten, term, but then only one survives in the TT gauge. Yes, other question. Yes. I, I don't ignore. I mean, so the question is about why did I ignore the first order? Is this the question? Okay, so I repeat the question for people in Zoomland. So, uh, what is the passage that led me from Einstein equation to this reinterpretation uh, as energy momentum tensor? So, I write the Einstein equation in um, trace reverse form. This is just trivial, trivial passage, I mean, okay? And then I, I say, uh, I expand in um, the amplitude of the gravitational wave. So, you have zero order, first order, second order. Of course, you have third order and more, but I forget about higher order. And then I say, all of this is equal to my energy momentum tensor that is made by uh, astrophysical sources, you know, binary black holes or whatever. Then I take an average over the wavelength uh, of my object. I take the average also here, of course, but this is not what we are interested in. So when I take the average of, um, of the background over one, two wavelengths, it doesn't change anything, no? Because the scale variation of the background, you know, it must be very separate in frequency, it must have a much longer wavelength, much smaller frequency, so this is basically the same thing. The average or itself is the same thing. Whereas the first order in gravitational wave goes to zero, no? Because my gravitational wave is ex exactly a variation over lambda. If I average a cosinus over its frequency, then it's zero, more, a bit more than definition. The second order is not zero because it's the square of, of the cosinus. The square of the cosinus is something like this and the average of it is not zero. Actually, no. The, okay. the average of the uh, square of the cosinus is not zero. So this one survives and I bring it to the other side. And then I say the energy of uh, the gravitational waves 
since whatever is on the right hand side by definition is an energy momentum tensor, I say this is an energy momentum tensor. And I just have to do some inverse trace reverse to express uh, T mu as a, as a function of R. No? This R2, I express it as um, T mu of gravitational wave minus one half eta mu trace of the energy momentum tensor of gravitational wave with a minus in front, eh? sorry. Minus R2, sorry. Minus R2 is equal to that. So it's actually this. Okay, is it clear now? So now that I identified the T gravitational wave mu nu, I just look at the T0,0 zero zero because you know it's the more of energy momentum tensor, usually what you look at for. Zero, zero is the energy density. And so this is the energy density. D0, zero, D0, zero, sorry, uh, this should be a mi I guess that it was a minus because here must be a plus. Because D0 and D0, ah no, sorry, sorry, it was no more minus. Because D mu, D nu, and alpha beta, alpha beta, okay. And then I get D0, D0, and then I get a plus, yes. So uh, I just focus on the zero, zero component. And so this is D0 H alpha beta, D0 H alpha beta. But then you remember for a, ra uh, for a wave which has one direction specifically which is outgoing radially, then I have that um, th there are only four components which are non-zero. So first, uh, the, the whatever is time, I kill it. Hmm? Alpha equal to zero and or beta equal to zero, I kill it. So all of these zero. I mean, they are physically there, like in the Schwarzschild uh, solution, this term is not zero and it's ultra important because it's the Newtonian potential, but surely not a wave. So for the sake of, uh, if you are interested to waves, this is zero. But then I have this H plus minus H plus, H cross, H cross, and then I have zero on the direction of propagator, propagation. I am assuming that the third direction is the radial direction. So I'm left th with these two components. And so if I open up this contraction, then this gives me twice H plus and twice H cross. It can only give me this, okay? So this is what I interpret gravitational waves. And since they are massless, basically the, the flux is given by the same thing. Uh, again, I call it flux, but usually in particle physics, flux is some um, energy flow per unit of surface per unit of time. No, in general relativity, for some reason, when people f call flux, it actually means luminosity. Uh, energy per unit of time, not per unit of surface. Yes. Yes, this energy momentum tensor, um, the question is about if it is conserved. Well, at uh, this level, it's... Uh, it's trivially conserved, no? Because it's quadratic order. So um, we never really check. I mean, basically, uh, non-conservation would go to, um, to higher order. And so we never go to more than quadratic order in, in the equation of motion uh, when we look at distant sources. So yes. Of course, we want to go well higher quadratic order when we are very close to the source. But when we look at far away, we just want to care about the, um, uh, the energy which is leaking from the system, we are uh, happy enough with the second order. Why is this? Because look at this. First order already goes as 1 over d. Mm -hmm. So uh, second order goes as 1 over d square. And then if you want to integrate this flux over surface, the, uh, the area of the surface goes as uh, d square. So this gives you a constant. Whatever is cubic order or higher must go with a higher power than two in the denominator. So when you integrate over surface at very large distance, it goes to zero. So for the energy flux balance, you can forget what, whatever is not quadratic because it will give you uh, something that decays higher than d square. And when you integrate over a sphere whose surface is d square, I mean, we, are, we don't move out of three plus one dimension, it doesn't count, and it doesn't count. Yes, more questions? Yes. Yes, this is my, yes, this is the only, yes. 
basically, you want more justifi I mean, the question was about uh, that this is the definition uh, of the energy momentum tensor of gravitational waves. You probably want a more physical uh, explanation why this is, or you're happy with that? No, mathem ah, come on, mathematically, it is something trivial. I mean, come on, mathematically, you cannot dispute what I did. Come on. I, I just, I mean, here there are cubic order or so, of course. Forget cubic, I mean, mat ah, if you want to be, ah, you are happy now. I mean, <laughs> uh, mathematically, it, this is uh, absolutely trivial. I mean, I just expand, I take the average, one piece goes away. I mean, the, phys the big physical leap is to interpret this as an energy momentum tensor. But this comes from the fact that whatever is on the right side, I interpret it as an energy momentum tensor. So in principle, this object, you see, is h square, so it doesn't have lambda variation. It has a constant piece. So in principle, this, constant, this piece contributes to the background curvature, OK? Because again, this wave is cosinus. This square is cosinus square, so it doesn't, uh, it has a piece, of course, cosinus square, you can expand one half plus cosinus two omega. So it has a piece that variates at even higher frequency, but in the average, it goes away. But it has a piece that contributes to the background. So it makes sense to make it in a background equation. And in a background equation, it contributes a little bit to the background um, curvature, but very little because it's h square. But what it matters is that we can uh, get from it any dot which is basically the integral over the surface of this d omega. Mm, and there is, yes, and I guess this is the exact formula. I didn't forget. Ah, yes, of course, there is uh, some um, uh, 32, uh, 16 pi g denominator. Or well, let's go back to 32 pi g, and here I put alpha beta. OK? So this is the luminosity due to gravitational waves. So the next step will be, um, sorry, there I call it D, here I call it R. R, no. And in the notes, I often use R, which is the typical size of the source, for the distance to the observer. Sorry for that. I will try to change it. So but now I call it D. Let's try to be consistent. So you can already see where we are heading to, I hope. We are heading to the fact that since H, here, I can specialize to space indices, OK? We know that the zero index don't contribute to gravitational wave. You see, h, we get it from here. It's linear in the source. It's linear in some integral in the source and goes as 1 over d. And so here, I get 1 over d squared. The d squared simplifies with the d squared. So I get a constant flux no matter wh where I put the surface, provided I put far enough. Uh, and then here, I get something which is quadratic in the source. So the energy radiated by gravitational wave must be quadratic in the source, which is natural, kind of natural. And we'll see, will depend on, you see, if we take the first order, will depend on the first derivative of the integrated space-space component of the energy momentum tensor. What we're going now to see, and then there is a d omega. This d omega is non-trivial because it depends on the um, uh, direction where, which you are looking at. No? We are looking at the flux of gravitational wave that is piercing the surface at very large distance. What is this, uh, the amplitude of the gravitational wave? It does depend on the direction we are looking from because of this. Of course, this is the source. It doesn't know wh which direction we are looking for. Where, I mean, where we place our source and from which direction we are looking at, I mean, this guy doesn't know. He's the source. He doesn't know about the observer. This guy knows about the observer because he tells you how much amplitude of gravitational wave is going to that direction n. And so basically what will happen here, that inside the integrand will only be left my lambda projector, and the q to which h is proportional will go out. So we'll get a qq term. 1 over d squared simplified with a d squared. I will get some number, some powers of g's. I get two powers of g, one for each h. I will get at the end something that will look like g times t k l dot square. OK, broadly speaking. Uh, we'll derive it mathematically, but just to get you. But physically, this is not, I mean, this is in principle correct, but it's not very profound. What is more profound is to write this as g q triple dot q l square, 
What is Q? Q is the second, is the quadruple, is the second moment of T00. You remember, I gave you a, um, a heuristic argument, even on Monday probably, to tell you that the second moment of the energy moment of the energy density with two derivatives, once I integrate it, must be equal to Tij, heuristically. I mean, this object has two indices, this object has two indices, fine. This object has two lengths, two derivatives, so they have the same dimension. This, of course, any component of the energy momentum tensor has the same dimension. And uh, what about the scaling of V? This must scale as V square. This has to do with, uh, no, uh, this is kind of sort of one cent M, V, I, V, J, so it has two powers of these. And uh, this has to do with the um, second derivative of the second moment. I can expect that if I derivate the, mass the second moment of the mass distribution, I get an x, I get a derivative, it gives me a v, x, and I get a derivative, it gives me another v. So heuristically, I can expect that this equation holds for how crazy it might look like, and in practice, it holds with a factor one half, and we're gonna drive right now. So the idea of the multiple expansion is to take this luminosity formula and trade it for Square of this, square of this, square of this. Here I get the contribution from the quadruple, second moment of the uh, uh, energy density. Here we get a contribution from, you see, I have an extra x. I have an n that depends on the direction of observation that will go outside. And then I have an x prime over which I'm integrating it over. That will give me a third index. So that will, um, you can already guess that this will give me something like the third moment of the energy momentum tends of the energy density with an extra derivative. Actually, there will be a surprise here. I mean, that when I do, let me anticipate the surprise and then we work out in detail mathematically. So you see, Tij will be traded for T00, Xi, Xj, double dot. Tij, Xk, hmm, we, one extra x, you might want to trade it for T00, xi, xj, xk with three dots. Three dots to save the dimension, three indices to save the three indices. And you may think, well, but there is something that doesn't, even heuristically, that is not quite right. Look at this. This object is symmetric in the ij, this object is symmetric in ij, fine. This object is symmetric in ij, but it's not symmetric in ijk, okay? This object is symmetric in ijk. So there must be something left here. Otherwise, I cannot do the matching, even heuristically. And you remember, I guess, my Brazilian students apparently have always troubled to remember the addition of angular momenta, but I, I hope you don't. So what happens when I do an L equal to one plus an L equal to one? I get to what? Two, one, and zero, okay? So when I get two indices and I symmetrize and I take out the trace, I only get the two. The zero is what comes out of the trace, and the one is what comes out if I anti-symmetrize the two indices. So Tij is only, only has the two, because you see I'm projecting out the trace with the lambda tensor, so Tij is a pure two, okay? So Tij is a pure two. You understand what I mean when I say it's a pure two? It's a pure five-dimensional representation of the rotation, okay? L equal to two means five-dimensional representation. Tij xk, is a two plus a one. Two plus a one. What does a two plus a one does? A three, a two, and a one. Okay, addition of angular momentum. I, c I don't have the time to explain addition of angular momentum here. I mean, I assume you know it. Okay, the three is this one. The fully symmetric piece is the three. The one you can expect is projected out because it's basically, when I take the trace, of any pair, I take a one, but the one should not contribute to the gravitational wave. It should be projected out by the lambda tensor, but the two, the two has all the right to stay. What is the two? The two will happen to be uh, mm. Sorry. Will happen to be this one. I first write it and then I explain. 
okay? So this product between the two and the one should generate a three and a two. Also a one, but the one we don't care because it's projected out by the lambda tensor. The lambda tensor always uh, project out things that are below two. So look at this. When I take one index and another index and I pair them, so these are a representation of SO3. Three times three makes a nine. A nine is the composite five plus three plus one. Five is the spin two, three is the spin one, one is the spin zero. L equal to two, L equal to one, L equal to zero. The L equal to one they are obtained by combining two indices is the anti-symmetric combination of these two indices. So what I have to do here to complete all the representations that are generated by these, I have to take the fully symmetric, L equal to three, and then I have to anti-symmetrize A and K, and then of course I have to symmetrize in I and J. So you see, I generate this object, which is the triple moment, the octuple of the energy density with three de de derivatives just to compensate dimension. And then I generate the second anti-symmetric moment of T0i. Again, this is highly non-trivial to see that it come out, but theoristically, this has to come out. And look at this, if there wasn't, if, if here I had only Ti, if I had only one index, forget J, and if I had only one index anti-symmetrized with K, what would it give? This is Ti's A, T0i is velocity. Velocity, first moment of the velocity anti-symmetrized. What is that? Velocity times X anti-symmetrized. It's a known friend. It's a known friend of us. It's the angular moment, okay? So here, what I'm getting at this order is the first moment of the angular moment. So why I don't get the angular momentum earlier? Well, the angular momentum is conserved, it cannot radiate. It's like in this formula, again, for, to source H, to source metric perturbation, everything source, mass, source energy momentum, mass source uh, gravitational perturbation, angular momentum source uh, gravitational perturbation. But here I, I, um, I work in a TT gauge, I already projected out what is not radiative. So here, the angular momentum does not appear. The mass does not appear, linear momentum does not appear, angular momentum does not appear. But second moment of the mass appear. First moment of the mass is dipole. Again, it cannot appear. The dipole is conserved. Second of the mass starts appearing in the radiation. Angular momentum cannot appear in the radiation because it's conserved, it cannot radiate. But first moment of angular momentum starts appearing. So you see the fun of this expansion. I get quadruple at leading order. And next to leading order, I get third moment of the mass, octuple, and first moment of the angular momentum. And then I go on. Basically, all the sources of gravitational wave radiation can be classified as um, multiples of mass, starting from the second multiple, fr starting from the quadruple, or multiple of angular momentum, starting from the first multiple of uh, the first momentum of angular momentum. Here momentum is used in two different meanings. Momentum in the sense of statistical distribution and momentum in physics, okay? This is the first moment of the angular momentum, which is the first um, source that appears in the odd parity sector. And this is the third moment of the energy density, which is the second uh, moment that appears in the even parity sector. Even parity and odd parity is related to time reverse, I mean, to, to, to the parity, basically, you know. This is anti-symmetric, is sort of parity of, angular, of uh, magnetic field. Basically, this has the parity of angular momentum, this has the parity of mass. Yes, question, oh, many questions. Here first and then. Exactly, no mass dipole because the um, uh, conservation of center of mass. So if the, the variation of the dipole, the dipole, if the dipole variates, it means that the linear momentum is not conserved. No? Mx, you take the derivative, it gives you mv. The sum of mv is the total momentum. But the total momentum cannot variate, otherwise you don't conserve energy momentum, and so on. Other questions? Oh, yeah, it works exactly the same, yes, basically. With the difference that in electromagnetic, it starts one order less. It starts with the dipole, because in, uh, the dipole is E times X, and E times X is not conserved. M times X is conserved, but E times X is not conserved. So this very same expansion starts with the dipole. Okay. So be, just be careful. If you look um, at your notes in electrodynamics, this is the expansion of the radiative multiples. 
In electrodynamics, it's also very popular to treat uh, electrostatic multiples, where the expansions come from the denominator. You remember, this was a x minus x prime. If you, if you consider that, I mean, electrostatic, you, you can have sources which are nearby, and so this x prime might not be too, too small with respect to x. So when you expand this, you get this x prime here at the, at the numerator. So you can have a static source where all this expansion is zero, just because the time component, the derivative is zero. But then the, the x prime comes from the expansion of the denominator. That's the electrostatic um, expansion. And then it gives you quadruple, octuple, and so on, that goes as higher power of the distance. You see, here you get, in electrodynamics, you will get a dipole that goes as 1 over r squared, an octopole that goes as 1 over r cubed. Those are electrostatic, okay? And so those are fading off with the higher power of x because you are expanding this. But if the source is time varying, then forget about this expansion in the denominator. Then you expand really the entry component of the source, and then you get dipole dot divided by r, and so and you get one over r behavior of the electric field because dipole, you see, the electric field should be q over r. So if you have a dipole, you have one x more in the numerator. So either you compensate with one length more in the denominator by considering the, the dipole field that follows one over r squared if it's static, or you get a dipole which is time dependent. And so dipole dot is the same order, the same dimension as e. And so you get dipole dot over r, then you get q double dot over r again, and so on in electrodynamics. In um, gravitational waves, just because you have one extra index, you start with quadruple. And then you get quadruple two dots divided by r, octuple three dots divided by r again. So these are all one over r fields because the source is time dependent. If the source wasn't time dependent, you could expand here the denominator, but then you would get uh, steeper fall off at infinity. So we don't care about one over r square fall off at infinity because they don't carry out energy. This is what happened for the longitudinal mode. The longitudinal mode field goes as one over r, but it's, uh, if you want to compute this derivative, follows with higher power of r, so they don't radiate energy. Yeah. This is E dot because basically uh, we take T, uh, the, basically the T0i. So Tij here. So t, uh, the, the, two dub, the double dots, they are there to compensate dimensions. So Tij xk. It has, to, it has to have three, three, three space um, components just to match uh, indices. But then since I have three Ls, ah, sorry, you're right. I only need two dots, yes, yes. I was thinking, yeah, thank you. Then another dot can come from here. Yeah, but you're right. The, the, the way I wrote was, was wrong. Yes, thank you. And, uh, and here, you see, to, here you get the, the right, here to get the right scaling uh, with dimension, you must need a dot. Hmm? Yeah, because here I have two lengths, one is eaten by this, one length stays. Okay. And you see that we have the right scaling with Vs, because here we have V square he, and an X, here we have V square and an X, here I have one V from here, another V by combining is two, and an X. So V square and an X. 1v from t0i, t0i is already linear in v, and then the dot with an x goes another v, and then v squared and an x. Okay, this is a simple way to check uh, the consistency. Then, of course, the coefficient here in front, then you have to compute. I will compute the coefficient here, and I will leave you as an exercise to compute this. The exercise is done in very much detail in the notes. Maybe not in the latest version. I will upload the latest version right after this lecture. And so you can compute this expansion and this expansion. But this is, as you can understand, this is just a little bit more than group theory. You, know? you just have to expand into L equal to three piece and L equal to two piece. But let's do how to, let's see how to do this so you learn the trick. It's just a trick. Again, the, the physics I already explained to you. Now let's learn the trick to derive it mathematically. Yes, question. Yes, electric dipole. Mm -hmm. So, no, exactly. That's why, you, so the question was, in, uh, in electromagnetic, we have a dipole radiation because we have negative, positive, uh, negative charge, and, and uh, it's fine. 
uh, here in, you don't need to have a negative mass to have a dipole, no? Because suppose you have a background mass, and then you have an over mass, and then an under mass. Still both larger than zero, but above uh, the, f the fixed level. So the offset, you forget, because it has no gradient, no radiation. If you have, um, if you have an offset in, uh, which are both positive, but they are mutually varying, you still have a dipole. The point is that the dipole, it cannot variate, because otherwise it means that the total momentum is varying. But the total momentum, by definition, cannot vary. Or at least it cannot oscillate. No? We are looking at things that emit at, at a high frequency. The total momentum eventually varies because gravitational waves carry out energy, carry out momentum. So the total momentum will vary, but this is called a secular variation. So the energy and momentum and angular momentum, they do vary, but on a secular scale. Like not on century scale, but anyway, on very long time scale, which is given by the radiation reaction. Whereas HIJ, this radiative field, varies on, on the time scale of the source, which is a completely different scale. So in first approximation, we say that mass, angular momentum, momentum do not variate. They only vary on secular scale, and they don't radiate. This is the radiative piece that varies on whatever arbitrary time scale is set by the source. OK, so can I do the trick to derive this now? Yes. I, I, I think I motivated strong enough so that now you, you, you must be curious. You should be curious to know how to do that. OK, so my view on, on the classicalness of uh, Feynman amplitude is, is going to be tomorrow. For sure, I won't have time to do it today. Yes. So we do it in two steps. So you learn the trick properly. So I want to say, what happens to this I take the first moment of this object. This is T0k, xi. This is, must be equal to zero, like any honest uh, total divergence of uh, something which is confined to a, a, a regional space. So the energy momentum tensor goes to zero, but exactly zero outside the source. My source is, again, 100 kilometer scale. I integrate over the source. Even if I take the first moment, any finite moment, I could take 100 moment. No matter how, I mean, if I take a 100 moment, this x prime means that it grows with distance. But this goes to 0, exactly 0 at a finite scale. So this always will be finite. So for anything that is confined in a finite volume, the total divergence is 0. Just because I can trade it for, um, for an integral over a surface at infinity, by definition, my source is confined. At infinity, I have 0 source. This, so this is always 0. But let's see what it tells us. This tells us, so from now on, I will forget writing the integral. All the equation I will write from now on only hold on the integral sign. Then I get that t0k, comma k, xi, must be equal to minus t0k uh, delta ij. OK, this is trivial, provided it's under the integral sign. Eh? I, OK? No, it's not covariant because we are on Minkowski. And basically, whatever is the, the covariant piece will be a gamma times t. And basically, if the gamma is of the, uh, the background, that is it's another time scale. We don't care. And if it's the gamma of the gravitational wave, it will be second order. Yes, this is. Uh, you're right, but this, the source is not flat, but you're right. But a, we always, uh, even, even here, h is smaller than 1. So h are important, but are never exceeding 1. So we, we consider the case that that's kind of corrections. But you know, actually, if the source is not conserved, you, you can take this, which is the same thing as taking this. I mean, these, these two are mathematically equivalent. The, the um, simple derivative with the square root of g or the total or the covariant derivative. These two are the same thing, and then you're right. Yes, you're right. You guess you're right. But yeah. 
basically I can invoke general covariance and assume that everything works. Uh, commuting, I mean, tra trading a, a comma into a semicolon, basically. So I, now I use um, conservation of, well, sorry, there was no dot here. This is T0 K comma K or semicolon K. Okay, now people never write the semicolon because, yes, yes, you might think this is, yeah, anyway, y y you can pretend that this is your energy momentum tensor and I call it T again, and then the simple, col the simple comma applies. Yes. No, they're, they're point like, but of course they, they curve, no, the space. The space can be, I mean, close to the black hole, the space can be curved with H close to one. Not, not exactly one, because GM over R is always smaller than one outside the black hole, by definition, but it can be close to one. So, yes, I don't have a deep answer to that. I will look it up. Let's keep it in mind. So the standard treatment you find, you just write this, and then you use the energy momentum conservation to say that this is minus T00 dot, Actually, it's, this is T00, comma dot low, comma dot low is, yes, a derivative, a covariant derivative with respect to the contravariant vector, which is T, so this keeps a minus, is equal to minus T0J, T0I. So minus and minus simplify. So look at this. The integral of T0I is equal to the first moment of the first derivative of the energy density. I guess now you see where I want to aim, no? I traded basically, it's not quite what we wanted yet, but I traded an object with one space and one time with an object with two times and one moment. Then you see where I want to get. Now I trade an object with two indices with an object with two momenta and two zeros here. How do I do it? Well, instead of having TAJ, I start with TKL XI XJ, and I take this, well, since I, I did already half of the job, let's start with this. Uh, yes. So we start with this, and this is again zero under the integral sign. And so this means that, so let's go there because it might be a bit longer. So this means that T zero K comma K X I X J must be equal to T let me skip one passage. Now, when the derivative applies here, this is delta ik, so it will be t0i xj plus t0j xi, and I guess there is a minus sign because I brought one on one side, the other on the other side. Okay? Now I do the same trick as before. This, the, the gradient is like t0, 0 dot, and then it also eats back the minus. So look at this. The t0, 0 dot xi xj is equal to that, but then I use the previous formula. Uh, uh, yes. No, then I really need, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm almost there. I forgot the last passage. How was the last passage? Uh, yes, I mean, it's kind of, T0i. I mean, this is correct. Let, let, let me see if I find the inspiration in the notes. Uh, and then we should wrap up. I forgot the last. Um, <sighs> okay, this is why, yes. Ah, no, okay, no, I need one, uh, one thing, one element more. I need to do this. I need to do this, which is, I do like, uh, uh, I have to do, ah, no, no, I was doing this right. So this one is, uh, I think this is right, no? I, I got this, so this, this object is the same thing as Q dot IJ, no? It's the second moment with one derivative, and is equal to that. So now what I need to do, Q dot is equal to that. Um, ah, yes. I just have uh, I just have to connect this to T I J, and then by using so thi this I already derived. So I need to connect this to T I J, and then I do it with T. Um, 
TIK, yes. It's TIK, X, J, comma, K, plus T, J, K, X, I, again, comma, K. OK? So I know this. Uh, first, I derive this by using uh, the, the second moment of T0K. Then I use the first moment of TIK. And then again, uh, this will give me TIK, comma, K is J plus TJK, comma, K, XI with a minus because I brought it to the other side. And this will give me, when K derive this, this will give me TIJ. And when K derive this, it will give me TIJ. OK? And then I use, again, the energy momentum tensor. And this is equal to t dot 0i xj plus t dot 0j xk. This is equal to 2 tij, again, under the integral sign. But then I use this. This is just one derivative less of this. So since this is equal to that, this must be equal to q double dot ij, which is what I wanted to demonstrate. OK? Again, all of these are also only under the integral sign. Mm -hmm. So the Tij, the energy momentum tensor, is I can trade it apart from a factor of 2 for the second derivative of the quadrupole moment. So you can iterate this trick like it's done in the notes. And you can check that the following order uh, for Hij. So for Hij, I will get so 2 lambda Ij KL, 1 over D, the 2 is because I, and then I get Q triple dot IJ plus 1 third octuple IJK triple dot plus user is called the, with some coefficient which is usually 2 thirds and so on. So this is the triple uh, moment, the third moment of the energy density. This is the first moment of the angular momentum with two derivatives, and so on. You, you can go on, of course, to arbitrary order. So the nice thing is that when you have to square h to get the flux, there's no mixing. Ah, sorry, here there is an nk, of course. And he, sorry, this is, Q, this is Q, kl. This is um, kl nm. Here we have an nm. Here we have to be, uh, be careful because this is the angular momentum is epsilon i j k t zero j x k. You know what we did was the the first moment antisymmetrized, and then so we get an epsilon. So we get an epsilon k. Uh, uh, no, sorry. So it, there is an a. So this is the first moment of the angular momentum. The angular momentum has an index a that came from the epsilon. And then we have uh, KL, no, not KL, KM, and then we have an L. OK, I mean, these are details that there's no time to, to go through it now. But anyway, uh, this uh, first moment of the angular momentum, uh, it involves some epsilon, but it's not important at this level. What is important is that I can have a, a, an expansion where, you know, now the integral does not appear anymore because I've done the integration. So I've traded my the integral of the space space component of the energy momentum tensor and their moment for derivative of the mass multiple or derivative of angular momentum multiple. Mass multiple, angular momentum multiple, and this goes on at all orders. Getting this coefficient right, of course, is non-trivial. It involves this fixing the group algebra of the combination of the representation. But what is nice is that now I can plug this back into the flux formula. So the flux formula was uh, 1 over 32 pi g lambda ij kl hij hkl dot the square integrated over the omega. So this I substitute now. So there is a g, of course. So here the d square simplified the d square. There is 1 over 32 pi g that stays. The d square simplifies. Here there is a 1g and one other g. And I get 1 over g, so I get only 1g remains. And then I get qij, qkl with three derivatives, one from the energy formula and two from the relationship between the dipole and h. 
and then I get the integral of the omega of lambda. So it's better to write this as divided by 4 pi, and so I take an 8 here. Okay, so it's clear how, I mean, maybe the passages you might not have followed, but it's clear, no? The flux must depend on quadratically on the source because the source uh, is, is a linear source for the field. It happens to have three derivatives because two are for relating the source to the field and one extra derivative for relating the field to the energy. So three derivatives and three derivatives. And what is non-trivial is this uh, angular uh, uh, integration because each direction see a slightly different amplitude of the wave. And you can think uh, if you're looking at the binary, there is an intrinsic breaking of symmetry. If you're looking at the binary from above or from the side, you should see a different field. There's no reason why you shouldn't. And indeed, you do see a different field and you see this parameterized by lambda. One thing you might ask, look, here there should be one lambda for each h. I put one lambda and one lambda. Why I don't have two lambdas here? Lambda is the projector. The square of itself is equal to itself. So I, I, it's enough to put only one lambda. So I let you to do this integral. I mean, this is, this is straightforward to do. It's a bit boring, but it's straightforward. Just using this fact that the integral of, this om of the omega. So this lambda will involve something like this, deltas. And this is equal to 1, of course. The integral, of, oh, no, sorry, is, in, is equal to itself. No, the omega over 4 pi is equal. Then it will involve some other integral, something like d omega divided by 4 pi of n i and j. And this will give you delta i j divided by 3. Why? Well, because this integral can only give a symmetric tensor, and I only have delta. And when I take the trace, this gives me 1. And when I take the trace, this gives me 1. And then the other uh, in piece of information that you need to perform all of this integral, you need the omega divided by 4 pi, n i, n j, n k, n l. Of course, if you have a node power of n, the integral is 0. And when you do this, you will get as a result delta j, delta k l, plus two permutations of indices divided by 15. Well, why this structure? Well, because it's the only completely symmetric structure. Why the 15? Because if you take all the traces, here you give you 15. So this you get 1 times 15. Sorry. If you take all the contraction here, you get 1. So all of these must be 1. If you take all of the contraction, the numerator gives you 15. So you better have a 15 denominator to match this. So with these two pieces of information, the integral of n i and j and the integral of n i and j and k and l, you get that the result of this is g over 5 q i j q k l uh, delta i j delta i k delta j l minus 1 third minus 1 third delta i j delta k l. So this structure of contraction, contraction minus the trace is to be expected. The trace of q should be projected out of the h and then even more from the energy. So the only non-trivial factor that you get at the end is this 1 over 5 that comes non-trivially of the addition of all these things with 1, 1 over 3, 1 over 15, you get this non-trivial 1 over 5. And then if you substitute three dots, and then if you want to wrap up with the flux formula, you just have to, to, to um, plug in the, the, okay, this is the trick I can cancel. The final thing, and then I open the floor for question, is that you take the quadruple as ij is equal to mu xi xj. Now here, I don't need to take out the trace or anything because this is already accounted by this tensor or your structure. And then I do you know, q dot ij is equal mu vi xj plus xi vj. And then a Q, Q double dot, and then a Q, Q triple dot. If I do all of this, and then I get mu AI with J plus mu VI J plus two, let's put the mu in evidence, VI VJ, okay? I hope you want to spare me from writing Q triple dot. I mean, it's trivial. The nice thing here is that I trade uh, the, um, inside the A uh, for the equation of motion, so I get mu is equal to uh, gm over r 
square xi. Vj plus Vi gm over r square uh, xj plus 2 Vi Vj. OK? So I do the derivatives. Whenever I hit an acceleration, I trade it for the equation of motion. And then I go on with the Q triple dot that I will not write down now. And then I take the contraction. And so when I take the contraction of this, I get g over 5 q triple dot ij q triple dot kl. Let's me write ij ij traceless. Mm -hmm. If I take out the trace, then this is simply the contraction of one quadruple with the other. And let's try to guess the v to the 10. How, can it, how does it come that I get v to the 10? Look at this object, no? Q triple dot will be something like A times V, OK? Q triple dot. This is Q double dot. Q triple dot will be something A times V. When I square it, it will be A square V square, OK? Um, yes. And then uh, A square, I write it as G square, M square, divide, sorry, gm, gm over r square. This is r cube. So a, a is gm, m square, divided by r to the fourth, OK? And then here I have v square. And then I had, uh, I had uh, 1g to start with. Now I'm not taking care of this coefficient that will be altered by this sum. So look at this. Then I get this. What can I do? So I don't have. Um, Ah, yes, and then I have a mu square in front, of course, no? Because let me say one mu from each q. So this mu, I like to write it as eta square, the symmetric mass ratio, times m square. So look at this. This I can write it as g to the 4, m to the 4, divided by r to the 4, times v square, and then I get eta square over g. This is which power of v? gm over r is v square, gm4 divided by r4 is v to the 4, is v to the 8, so this is v to the 10. So you see, I got the structure of the flux formula. I have eta square, v to the 10, and 1 over g. And then the number that comes out is this. This is for circular orbit. So this is a generic formula for um, just quadrupolar emission. I'm forgetting all the other multiples. And when I uh, specialize to circular orbit, where did I specialize for circular orbit? Here, I take the second derivative. Up to here, it's completely general. But then I substitute the equation of motion. And I say that um, well, here, still not circular orbit. But then when I take the contraction, I say the x and v is 0, and v, v times v is uh, v square. And then I substitute gm over r as v square. I get this final formula. And sorry, and now I can stop. Thank you. Um, so maybe it should be better to postpone the questions for another time, or maybe you can ask them in private in due of time. So we have to be back here at 2 for the IFT colloquium. So that's it. Yeah.